Hello everyone, I'm Himanshu Asnani from Department of Mechanical Engineering and the subject name for today is uh, Material Science, subject code is ME207, unit number 4, lecture number 26 and uh, today's topic is Spring Steel and Heat Treatment of Steels. So learning objective for today's lecture is to provide the students with a basic understanding of Spring Steels and uh, Heat Treatment of Steels. Learning outcome of our today's lecture will be students will have learned, students have learned the basics of steel, heat treatment of steel and students have understood various types of spring steel and heat treatment of steels. So let's start with the today's lecture. So we have been studying about various materials in the past also. So now we are studying with the spring steels. The most suitable material for springs are those which can store up maximum amount of work on ener or energy in a given weight or volume of spring material. Now without permanent deformation. So these steels should have a high elastic limit as well as high deflection value. So the spring steels for aircraft and automobile purposes okay, should possess maximum strength against fatigue, effects and shock. So the steels most commonly used for making springs are as follows like high carbon steels. So before discussing all these kinds of different kinds of steels, one of the most important thing that the most suitable material for springs are the those which can store up the maximum amount of work okay, or energy in a given weight or volume of spring material without permanent deformation. Okay. So if this property is there then the material is suitable for it. So let's start with the high carbon steel. They say that these steels will contain 0 0.6 to 1.1 percent carbon, 0 0.2 to 0.5 percent silicon and 0 0.6, okay, not 0 0.6 to 1 percent manganese. Okay. High carbon steel they contain 0.6 to 1.1% carbon, uh, 0.2 to 0.5% silicon, and 0.6 to 1% manganese. So these steels are heated to 780 to 850 degrees centigrade according to the composition and quenched in oil or water. Okay, so it is then tempered at 200 to say, 500 degrees centigrade to suit the particular applications. Now these steels are used for laminated springs or for locomotives. Now here the applications are coming for locomotives, carriages, wagons and for heavy road vehicles. Now the higher carbon content oil hardening steels are used for volute, spiral and conical springs and for certain types of petrol engine inlet valve springs. So you can see the wide applications are there for high carbon steels okay what they do they have their particular composition and these steels are then heated to 780 to 80 degrees centigrade according to the composition and then coins in oil or water okay now it is then tempered at around 200 to 500 degrees centigrade to suit the particular applications okay and they, they have the applications in locomotives or wagons and carriages and heavy road vehicles also so let's go to the next steel now this is the chrome vanadium steel. Okay. Now these are highly co high quality spring steels. What these uh, the first one was the high carbon steel. The second is chrome vanadium steel. And these are high quality spring steels and contain 0 0.45 to 55, 0 0.55 percent carbon. Okay. The this 0.9 to 1 percent chromium and 0 0.15 to 0.2 percent vanadium. 0.3 2.5 percent silicon and 0.5 to 0.8 percent manganese. Now these steels have high elastic limit, resistance to fatigue, and impact stresses. So moreover, these steels can be machined without ductility and can be given a smooth surface free from tool marks. Okay. Now these steels, they are, you can say, having the, you can say, good machinability. That's why I said that these steels can be machined without difficulty. And these can be given a smooth surface free from tool marks. These are hardened by oil quenching at 850 degree to 870 degree centigrade and tempered at 470 degree to 510 degree centigrade for vehicle and other spring surfaces. So these steels are used for motor car laminated and oil springs for suspension purposes, automobile and aircraft engine wall springs. So you can see this this chrome vanadium steel called as high quality spring steel. These have the applications in automobile and aircraft engine wall springs. So this is really good. Now silicon manganese steel, the third type. Now these steels it contains around five or one point eight to two point zero percent silicon, 
0.5 to 0.6 percent carbon and 0.8 to 1 percent manganese. Now these steels have high fatigue strength, resistance, and toughness. These are hardened by quenching in oil at 850 to 900 degrees centigrade and tempered at 475 to 525 degrees centigrade. Now these are usual standard quality modern spring materials and are much used for many engineering purposes. Now this is these are these are the usual standard quality modern spring materials and are uh, much used for many engineering purposes. Now you can see that uh, the process of hardening and you can say tempering is followed in every spring steel. Okay, so this is uh, a very good you can say uh, heat treatment that we uh, should know. So uh, now this is an example of a sodium. Like it is also a metal. Okay, but it's a soft. A knife can easily cut through a piece. Okay, and sodium is stored in oil or stop air or moisture reacting with it. Okay. So now the steel heat treatment of steels. Now the you know that in the previous spring steel we have uh, listened to some words like tempered and uh, you can say uh, hardened. So these two terms were used very uh, very effectively in all the three different kinds of spring steels. So that means that there is some treatment uh, with the help of heat is given to steels to enhance their properties. This is called as heat treatment of steels. Okay. So let's discuss about these heat treatment of steels in detail. Here we will study about all the heat treatments in detail. Okay. For having a basic knowledge of what all kinds of heat treatments are done. With steels. Okay. Now the heat treatment refers to the heating and cooling operations required to alter the properties of metals and alloys. Now changes in materials properties result from changes made in the microstructure of the material. The heat treatment this can be applied to ignots and castings and semi-finished products, welded joints and various elements of machines. Okay. Now during heat treatment of a metal piece when it is heated to a definite temperature followed by cooling at a suitable rate, okay, there occurs changes in the microstructure of the conscious of the con uh, micro constituents of the metal. Okay. There occurs changes in the micro constituents of the metal. Now, these changes in the micro constituents of the metal may be in the in their nature, or form, or size, and distribution in the metal piece. Okay, so obviously. Ah, temperature of heating and rate of cooling are the main constituents or are the main controlling factors of changes in micro constituents. Okay, the temperature of heating and the rate of cooling, these are the main controlling factors. Okay, for changes in the micro constituents, these changes in micro constituents then control the changes in physical and mechanical properties of heat treated metal specimens. What? These changes in the micro constituents then control the changes in the physical and chemical properties, physical and mechanical properties of heat treated metal specimens. For various fabrication and manufacturing operations, heat treatment is a very important process. Okay, so the principle of heat treatment of steels. Okay, the principle of the theory of heat treatment is that when an alloy has been heated above a certain temperature. It undergoes a structural adjustment or stabilization when cooled to room temperature. What happens? When alloy, it has been heated above a certain temperature. Okay. It undergoes a structural adjustment or stabilization when cooled to room temperature. Now the cooling rate this plays an important role in this operation. The structural modification is mainly based on the cooling rate. Uh, heat treatment are normally applied to hypoelectroid carbon steels because steels, the hypoelectroid reaction in the iron carbon diagram involves the transformation and decomposition of austenite into perlite, cementite, and martensite. I show you this diagram in the in the next diagram in the next slide. You will see that the this iron carbon diagram, which is showing the uh, the transformation and decomposition. Okay, this iron carbon diagram is showing the transformation and decomposition of austenite into perlite, cementite, and martensite. Okay, and it also shows the temperature ranges and the heat treatment processes. The common microstructure of steel obtained during heat treatment is also shown in this figure. So you can see these two figures are important. 
in the first figure that is which is showing the heat treatment range for carbon steels okay so you can see that there are processes like hardening and annealing and normalizing okay stress relief annealing and the sterilizing all these processes are shown i'll tell you in the later slides these things and on the in this first figure you can see the composition of percentage carbon on the horizontal axis and temperature on the degree centigrade on the work so you can see that this uh, this is giving you a good idea of the various uh, you can say processes that are done at particular temperatures then the second is the microstructure of steel okay in this you can see that the structure of ferrite and perlite and uh, austenite okay and this martensite nodular trusite thorite all these are shown to you for information now the purpose of heat treatment that is important why why you are studying this this is the purpose the purpose of heat treatment of steels so the purpose of heat treatment is to achieve any one of the more objective like to remove the strain hardening of a cold work metal and to improve its ductility okay and to relieve internal stresses step up during work Cold during cold working, casting, welding, and hot working treatments. Okay, the internal stresses that are set up during these processes, like cold working or casting or welding, okay, hot working, you, you need to relieve the, those internal stresses into heat treatment. Then to remove gases from castings, to soften a metal, to improve its machinability, and to increase the resistance to wear, heat, and corrosion. Okay, so this is the, also a good purpose. Or to improve the cutting ability, that is the hardness of a steel tool, to improve grain structure after hot working a metal, and to remove effects of previously performed heat treatment operation. So these all objectives are really important. Okay, now one of the most important that you can the I which I feel that to remove gases from castings. Okay, because during casting some what some gases are trapped inside the if you can say the casting during the process because we are not able to easily escape so this heat treatment processes this can help you to remove those gases from the casting and obviously it will improve its machinability okay now the, um, some more purposes are there like to improve the magnetization property especially of steels for producing permanent magnets so to refine the structure after hot working or metal Okay, so you find the structure after all this new metal. Now to soften and toughen a high carbon steel piece. To soften and toughen a high carbon steel piece. To produce a single phase alloy in stainless steel. And to produce a hard wear resistance case on a tough core of a steel part. To harden non ferrous metals and alloys, especially aluminum alloy. And to produce a single phase alloy in stainless steel. To produce a hard wear resistance case on a tough core of a steel part and to toughen the hardened steel piece at the cost of its hardness. So you can see the wide range of purposes this heat treatment of steel has. Okay. Now you can see that to soften and toughen to soften and toughen a high carbon steel piece is also a very nice purpose application also. Okay. So now the principal kinds of heat treatment are like annealing, normalizing, hardening, tampering, case hardening, uh, surface hardening. Okay, so each of them has number of varieties. So I think we will be discussing small small amount of all these heat treatments in the coming slides. Now let's start with the annealing. Okay, now this is a kind of a heat treatment after which a metal or alloy acquires a structure close to the equilibrium line. So material is exposed to an elevated temperature for an extended time period and then slowly cooled. So normally annealing is carried out to relieve stresses, increase softness, ductility and toughness and or to produce a specific microstructure. Okay, so in this what happens? The in annealing what happens? The material is exposed to an elevated temperature for a particular time, okay, and then it is slowly cooled. Okay, so the purpose behind doing annealing is to relieve the relative stresses, to increase the softness, to improve ductility, to improve the toughness, and produce a specific microstructure. So in the diagram also you can see that how the annealing process is okay going on. 
the temperature of heating the annealing it depends on the first the composition of an alloy because the composition is important so automatically the the dependency of temperature on the composition of the alloy is related a particular kind of the process of what you want to do when the rate of cooling from the annealing temperature is usually not high it is within 30 to 200 degree centigrade per hour okay so rate of cooling is not high okay so there are a variety of annealing treatment process these are characterized by the changes these are induced so which many times are microstructural and are responsible for the alteration of the mechanical properties annealing process is normally consists of three stages okay the first is heating to the desired temperature okay the first stage is heating to the desired temperature second is holding or soaking at the temperature and third is cooling usually to room temperature okay so here they say that the rate of cooling for annealing temperature is not high it is between 30 to 200 degrees centigrade per hour so this all the three stages these are important okay first you heat the work to a desired temperature then you hold it at that temperature and then you, you cool it usually to room temperature so in these annealing processes the time is an important factor so there exist temperatures variance between the outside and the inside portions of the piece during heating and cooling obviously the outer surface will cool faster the inner surface will cool it slowly okay now the magnitudes of temperature variance depend on the size and geometry of the piece obviously if the size is big then it will take more time to cool down the interior also will take more time to cool down okay Obviously, the temperature the temperature variance and this depends on the size and geometry of that piece now if the rate of temperature changes too great temperature variance and internal stresses may be induced that may lead to wrapping or even cracking so moreover the actual annealing time must be long enough to allow for any necessary transformation reaction so annealing temperature is also an important consideration so since diffusional processes are normally involved and therefore annealing may be accelerated by increasing the temperature. The various types of annealing are like full annealing, process annealing, spherodized annealing and diffusion annealing. Okay. So we have to, uh, these are the four kinds of annealing process that are carried out. So the basic, uh, you can say, purpose behind annealing is to relieve the stresses. Okay. To relieve the stresses to improve the ductility of the material. So in this way we go we use the annealing process okay now next is the normalizing process so normalizing process is a process of heating the metal that alters the properties of the metal like uh, tensile strength ductility and also refines the grain structure okay now uh, it is a type of uh, heat treatment applicable to ferrous metals only now here is the condition of normalizing process it is saying that this heat treatment process of steel is, is applicable to ferrous metals only now in the normalizing process the material is heated to an elevated temperature and after that it is cooled back by placing it in contact with air or at room temperature so we say in this process the material is again heated to an elevated temperature and after that it is cooled back by placing it in the, with in contact with air at room temperature so the process of cooling the metal with air is called as air quenching so this is normalizing process is very interesting they say this they heat the material to elevated temperature and after that it is cooled back by placing it in contact with air at room temperature and this process of cooling metal in air is called as air quenching so this normalizing process changes the microstructure of The metal it the it increases the ductility and obviously it increases the hardness of the metal now normalizing is needed because the ductility is decreased and hardness increased by different processes like hammering okay so it is most commonly used to change the mechanical properties of metal so that it becomes easily serviceable and can be machine perfected it is most commonly used to change the mechanical properties of metal so that it, it becomes easily serviceable and can be machine perfect.
since heating is done above the upper critical temperature limit so it automatically softens the steel and heating is done up to austenitic state and the softening of steel automatically relieves the locked in strain which in turn removes the residual stresses so you can see this process is really smooth okay this is really good so in how what the purpose was behind that that uh, you need to increase the ductility of the material and increase the hardness of the metal so this was the big purpose behind normalizing process okay now you can see this normalizing temperature range with you so on the x axis you have this carbon content on which you have two kinds of steel available hyperutrectoid steel and hyperutrectoid steel okay the first one is hyperutrectoid uh, below 0.8% of carbon and after 0.8% of carbon you have hyperutrectoid steel okay now you can see that there is a low critical temperature at 723 degrees centigrade okay and above that you have the normalizing range okay you can see this range up a side so on the vertical axis you can see the temperature as a gradient that is used okay so this is how this normalizing temperature is range is shown with the help of this blue line for your information now normalizing process now in this process the metal is heated to about 40 to 50 degrees celsius above the upper critical temperature for that metal okay now the upper critical temperature it depends upon the percentage of carbon present in that metal okay the upper critical temperature it depends upon the percentage of carbon present in that metal and the time for which the metal is heated should be chosen such that the heat transfer is uniformly spread throughout the metal okay now normally they say that they heat the metal to about 40 to 50 degrees centigrade okay you want to say that they heat the metal to about 40 to 50 degree centigrade above the upper critical temperature okay so whatever time you are choosing for heating the metal you should be chosen such that the heat transfer is uniformly spread throughout the metal now normalizing is commonly performed after forging or casting okay so cold working and casting are manufacturing processes that produces grain structure that may require normalizing process before the component is put into service okay now these two processes like cold forging or cold working and casting they require they require this normalizing process before you put the component in service so this is this is having its application now now normalizing relieves internal stresses caused by the cold work and in this process heating is carried out in the air for subsequent machining or surface finishing is required to remove a scale or decarburized layers okay so this heating is carried out in the air obviously so you can understand so some scaling the form okay so they require certain finishing the purpose for normalizing process why why do we do this normalizing process well, the first is to improve machinability now different machining processes like facing taper turning boring drilling it can be carried out smoothly after the normalizing process okay so basic purpose of this normalizing process is like to improve machinability and just we studied in our previous slide also that uh, if you are if you are doing cold working or casting as uh, the manufacturing processes then it will require normalizing process before you put the component into service okay so uh, the purpose behind normalizing process is it will improve the machinability of the workpiece so different machining operations like facing and paper turning and boring drilling can be carried out smoothly after normalizing process to modify and refine cast dendritic structure so you can modify the defects caused after a process like casting so to refine the grains so it is used to refine the grain structure which changes some mechanical properties of the metal it is used to refine the grain structure which changes some mechanical properties of the metal now to make the material suitable for further heat treatment so material is made suitable for further heat treatment like hardening process okay now if if the grains are refined like the third purpose was to refine the grains so it is used to refine the grain structure which changes some different properties of the uh, metal so this is also very important okay like this it will happen it will relieve the internal stresses of the material this also be there then to improve the tensile strength of the material so in this way they help you this knowledge process help you 
Now, normal in process procedure, it takes into three main steps. The first is recovery stage, the second is recrystallization stage, and third is grain gel stage. So you can see these three stages of normalizing in this diagram. The time is there on the horizontal axis and the temperature is there on the vertical axis. Okay. So you can see this uh, process like heating is there in the starting, then you are holding your recrystallization stage, and then you have cooling using air known as air quenching. Okay, uh, right. Now the recovery stage. In the recovery stage, a furnace or further heating device is used to increase the temperature of the material to such extent where it external stresses can be relieved. Okay, it causes completely austenitic structure formation in the material. Now, second is the recrystallization stage. Now, in the recrystallization stage, the material is heated above the recrystallization temperature but below the melting temperature, which causes new grains to form without stress. So, in this stage, the material is held at a constant temperature for some time for grain formation to take place. Okay, now at this point, the material is held, okay, first at the constant temperature. What happens that some grain formation is taking place at that point. Now the grain growth stage. Now during this stage, the new grains are developed completely, fully. So the growth of grains is of materials. Okay. Now in the third stage, what happens? The new grains are developed fully. So the growth of grains is so material is controlled by allowing the material to cool at room temperature to room temperature by keeping the material in the air. That is air quenching. Now in this process, the rate of cooling is more than that of annealing process. Or Cooling. So, due to faster rate of cooling, we get more refined structure as compared to annealing. We know that the rate of cooling in, in case of uh, normalizing, it is more than that of annealing process. Okay. So, this cooling is non-equilibrium cooling. Due to the faster rate of cooling, we get a more refined grain structure as compared to annealing. Now, after these three stages, the ductility of the material increases and its hardness decreases. What happens? Ductility of the material increases after these three stages like okay that we did so the ductility of the material that increases and the hardness decreases so also the material becomes more machine -made. so this is the you can say purpose behind this process normalizing process okay the ductility of the material increases and the hardness decreases after these three stages and the material becomes more machine -made. Now, let's the advantages of normalizing over annealing process. Now, it is faster than the annealing process as the rate of cooling is faster than annealing process because in the normalizing, the material is cooled by placing it in room temperature while in annealing, material is cooled at a controlled rate in the furnace. Okay, and the quality of the surface after machining of normalized parts is far more better than the annealed part. Okay, now in the normalizing, you cool it in the open air and while in annealing, you cool the material in the furnace only, so it, it, it is a difference. Okay. Now, quenching media is air that is outside the furnace, so that it becomes batch type production. Okay, and normalizing is less expensive than in an annealing because it does not require additional furnace time during the cool down process. So, you can see in the diagram also how this, the diagram is shown like per like structure between annealing and normalizing. Now, hardening process, hardening process in trees. You know, the hardening and hardness are two different, very different things. So one is process of heat treatment, the other is extrinsic property of a material. Now, hardening is a heat treatment process in which steel is rapidly cooled uh, from austenizing temperature. So, as a result of hardening, as a result of hardening, the hardness and wear resistance of steel are improved. Okay, what they say is hardening is a heat treatment process in which steel is rapidly cooled from austenizing temperature and as a result of hardening, the hardness and wear resistance of steel are increased. Now hardening treatment generally consists of heating to uh, hardening temperature, holding at that temperature, followed by rapid cooling such as quenching in oil or water or salt baths. Okay. You can see in this diagram there is a temperature range for heat treatment of carbon steels also. I have shown you previously also. Now, the high hardness developed by this process is due to the phase transformation accompanying rapid cooling. Now, rapid cooling results in the transformation of austenite at considerably low temperature into non equilibrium products. Okay. Now, the hardening temperature it depends on chemical composition. So, for plain carbon steels, it depends on the carbon content alone. 
Now, hypoeutectoid steels are heated to about 30 to 50 degrees centigrade above the upper critical temperature, whereas eutectoid and hypoeutectoid steels are heated to 30 to 50 degrees centigrade above low critical temperature. Okay, you can see in this diagram, you can see there is a range shown. Okay, um, you can see the carbon content on the lower side, on the horizontal axis, you can see. Okay, so it is showing that till 0.8% you will have hypoeutectoid steels and after 0.8% of carbon you will have hyperutectoid steels. Okay, so uh, the ferrite and perlite is transformed. This ferrite, this ferrite and perlite is transformed to austenite. At hardening temperatures for hypoeutectoid steels. What they say? The ferrite and perlite transform to austenite at hardening temperatures for hypoeutectoid steels. And this austenite transforms to martensite on rapid quenching from hardening temperature. The presence of martensite accounts for high hardness of quenched steel. So the main purpose of hardening tool steel is to develop a high hardness. This enables tool steel to cut other metals. With high hardness developed by this process also improves the wear resistance. Obviously, the hard, if the hardness is increased, then obviously the wear resistance might increase. Now, gears, shaft, bearings, okay, these are used in this. Now, tensile strength, the yield strength are improved considerably. Hardening structure. Now, because of rapid cooling, the high internal stresses are developed in the hardened steel, and these steels are generally brittle. So. Hardening is generally followed by another heat treatment known as tempering, which reduces the internal stresses. Okay, internal stresses and makes the hardened steel relatively stable. Okay, what happens that they, they develop these steels develop a property of bitterness after hardening. So we go for another process known as tempering. This tempering reduces the internal stresses and makes the hardened steel more reliable. Now the tempering process. Now, hardened steels are so brittle that even after a small impact will cause fracture. So, toughness of the steel can be improved by tempering. However, there is a small reduction in strength and hardness. So, you can see there in the diagram also hardness and elongation, how these two are shown with this, with the tempering temperatures, okay, on the horizontal axis. Now, hard tempering is a subcritical heat treatment process used to improve the toughness of a hardened steel. So, tempering consists of reheating of hardened steel to a temperature below lower critical temperature and is held for a period of time and is slowly cooled in air to room temperature. Okay, this is a really simple process. Now, at in, uh, tempering temperature, the carbon atoms just diffuse out and form fine cementite and softer ferrite structure. Left behind. So that's the structure of tempered steel consists of ferrite and fine cementite. So thus tempering allows to precipitate carbon as very fine carbides and allow the microstructure to return to BCT, that is body centered cubic structure. Now the temperatures are related to the functions of the parts. So cutting tools are tampered between 230 to 300 degrees centigrade. Huh? Cutting tools is a tampered between 230 to 300 degrees centigrade. It's greater ductility and Toughness are desired as in case of shaft or high strength bolts. The steel is tempered to a range of 300 to 600 degrees centigrade. So, this temperature of tempering it is related to the functions of the part. Okay, so we have to be careful that for what function you are utilizing that part. If you are using for a cutting tool, then it will be around 230 to 300 degrees centigrade. But if you are using for you can say shaft or high strength bolts, then this temperature will rise up to. 300 to 600 degrees centigrade. Now, tempering temperature is usually defined identified by the color. Okay. Now, tempering temperatures for tools and shafts along with temper colors. These are shown. Now, in tempering, depending on temperatures, the temperature is classified as low temperature tempering, medium temperature tempering, or high temperature tempering. When you talk about low temperature tempering, it is 150 to 50 degrees centigrade. When you talk about medium temperature tempering, it is about 350 to 400 degrees centigrade. When you talk about high temperature tempering, that is high temperature tempering, it is about 500 to 650 degrees centigrade. Okay, so this is how this you can say tempering is done. So you can see there is a tempering color of steel shown. Okay, how you can see that normalized and quenched, and all different different temperatures are shown, and the different different colors are displayed. They usually called as temper colors. Okay. In the diagram, so hence the name is tempering colors of steel. So different different colors are like temper colors in this. So tempering colors of steel. Now also you can see that tempering temperatures are usually identified by the color also. So 
tempering temperature for tools and shafts along with temper color these are shown that if uh, what happens when the if you get a temping color of around pale yellow so your temperature will be around 30 degree centigrade and normally it is done for lit tools or brass so these are some tables which you can see and which you can understand that uh, at what temperature what color will appear okay and in, in what application it may be used okay so quenching now quenching is a process of rapid cooling of materials now from high temperature to room temperature or even lower now in steels quenching results in transformation of austenite to martensite that is a non equilibrium constituent now during cooling the heat must be extracted what happens that during cooling the heat must be extracted at a very fast rate from the steel piece this is possible only when the steel piece is allowed to come in contact with some medium which can absorb heat from the steel piece within a short period now, under ideal conditions all the heat absorbed by the medium should be ejected to the surrounding immediately okay now we we just want to go for rapid cooling of materials okay and the cooling will be from high temperature to low temperature or even lower so we require a material we require a medium which can extract that heat at a very fast rate from the workpiece or you can say the steel piece okay and this absorbed heat uh, by the medium it will be then rejected to the surroundings immediately so this is called as quenching okay effect of quenching medium the quenching medium has a profound effect on the final phase of the material so quenching medium is directly related to the rate of cooling of the material so some of the widely employed quenching media like water aqueous solutions oils like mineral vegetable and even animal oils molten salts and bath and air these are some quenching medias that are commonly used and these depend from material to material so it varies okay so most of them water and oil are commonly used so molten salts are also used in there oils are also normally commonly used nowadays also a surface hardness in many situations hard and wear resistant surface are is required with the tough core so because of tough core the components can withstand impact load so the typical applications require these conditions include gear teeth okay cam shaft and bearing and clank pins clutch plates and uh, tools and dies so the combination of these properties can be achieved by the following methods like hardening and tempering the surface layers to the surface hardening that is flame hardening and induction hardening and then changing the composition of at surface layers that is chemical heat treatment of case hardening through carburizing nitriding and carburizing and cyanide process so you can do these processes whatever you feel like now flame hardening the flame hardening involves heating the surface of a steel to a temperature above a particular temp point that is to centrifuge it oxyacetylene flame and then immediately quenching the surface with cold water okay you are from here cooling the workpiece from high temperature to low temperature okay the heating or you can say the room temperature now heating transform the structure of surface layer to austenite and find quenching changes in the quenching changes into martensite so you can see this how this is done we can using an oxyacetylene flame for heating and then cooling with the cold water it's called flame hardening induction hardening the induction hardening this involves the placing the steel you can see in the diagram of uh, flame hardening how it is doing okay it is quite interesting okay now induction hardening induction hardening involves placing the steel components within a coil through which high frequency current is passed okay what happens in this in induction hardening in involves placing the steel components within a coil through which a high frequency current is passed so the current in the coil induce eddy current in the surface layers and heat the surface layers up to austenite state now then the surface is immediately quenched with cold water to transfer the austenite to martensite so this principle is called as induction hardening what they are doing they are placing the steel component within a coil or through which the high frequency current is passed okay the current is in the coil induce eddy current at the surface layers and heat the surface layers up to austenite state so this is simple shown in the diagram also which you can easily see the carburizing process so carburizing carried out on a steels containing 
carbon less than 0.2 percent. 0.2 percent. It involves increasing the carbon contents on the surface layers up to 0.7 to 0.8 percent, which is impressive. Okay, 0.7 to 0.8 percent. Now, in this process, the steel is heated in contact with the carbonaceous material from which it absorbs the carbon. So, this method is mostly used for securing hard and this for securing hard and wear resistant surface. What it is used for? Securing hard and wear resistant surface with tough core carburizing is used for gears and cams and bearings and clutch plates. Okay, you can see in the diagram how it is done. Now, nitriding. Now, nitriding involves diffusion of nitrogen into the product to form nitrides. The resulting nitride case can be hard than the carburized steel, and the process is used for an alloy steels containing alloying elements like aluminium, chromium, and molybdenum, which form stable nitrides. Okay, they form stable nitrides, so they are used for those alloy steels which contain these alloying elements like chromium, aluminium, and molybdenum. Now, nitriding consists of heating a component in a retort to the temperature of about 500 to 700 degrees centigrade. So, through the retort, the, the alumina, with the retort, the ammonia gas is allowed to circulate. And at this temperature, the ammonia dissociates by the following reaction. You can see the reaction. Then, the atomic nitrogen diffuses into steel surface and combines with the alloying elements, that is, chromium, molybdenum, vanadium. To form hard nitrides, the depth of which nitrides are formed in the steel depends on the temperature. The depth to which nitrides are formed in the steel, you are in the steel, it depends upon the temperature and the time allowed for the reaction. So after the nitriding, the job is allowed to cool slowly. After nitriding, the job is allowed to cool slowly. So since there is no quenching involved, the chances of cracking or distortion of the components are less. Now, the cyaniding process is similar to carbon nitriding. Cyanide is also involved the diffusion of carbon into and nitrogen into the surface of steel. Diffusion of carbon and nitrogen both into the surface of steel. It's called liquid carbonate. The components are heated to a temperature of about 800 to 900 degrees centigrade in a molten cyanide and bath and bath, cyanide bath consisting of sodium cyanide, sodium carbonate, and chlorium chloride. Sodium chloride. Okay. What they do, these components are heated to a temperature of about 890 degrees centigrade in a molten cyanide bath consisting of sodium cyanide. The temperature is about 800 to 900 degrees centigrade in a molten cyanide bath consisting of sodium cyanide, sodium carbonate, and sodium chloride. Okay, so after allowing the components in a bath for about 15 20 minutes, they are quenched in oil or water. The cyanide is normally used for low carbon steels and case depth are usually less than 0.25 mm, millimeter. Okay. So now the MCQs. Let's start with the MCQs because MCQs are also very important, and we need to uh, also discuss MCQs. So the, okay, so the main purpose of heat treatment is the steel steels is to change the you can say the mechanical properties. Okay, we need to change the modify the mechanical properties. So for that purpose, we do heat treatment. The answer is B, mechanical properties. Okay, the main purpose of heat treatment of steel is to change the mechanical properties. Now alloys containing 0.06 to 2 percent of carbon are considered as Okay, we are studying heat treatment of steels in this case, and we need to modify the mechanical properties of steels also. So, for that very purpose, here the answer is like alloy containing 0.062% of steel of percent carbon. Alloys containing 0.062% of carbon are considered as steel. Answer is A. Now, the hard alloy and tool steels are made easily machinable by following heat treatment. Okay, this treatment like annealing. Okay, they are made easily machinable with this process. So answer is C. Annealing. Now cast iron it contains carbon. Okay, how much carbon contains is there in cast iron? It is equal to two percent or less than point eight percent or less than two percent or more than two percent. So I think the answer is D. It's more than two percent. Now the cooling rate of a specimen it depends on the rate of heat energy extraction. It is a function of characteristics of the quenching medium in contact with the specimen surface and also on the size and geometry of the specimen. So I think it's true in this case. Okay. The answer is true. It depends on the size and geometry of the specimen. If the specimen is big, it will take different time. Okay. Now severity of quench is widely used to express the rate of cooling. Okay, it is used to express the rate of cooling. So the more rapid the quench, the more severe the quench is. I think it's true in this case. It's true. Answer is true. Ah, oil, water, oil, and air. What? Water, oil, and air. 
these are the three most common quenching in India. So I think it's true or false. Ah, uh, we have been discussing there in the past slides also. I think it's true. Water, oil, and air. These are the three most common quenching media. My answer is true. A. Ah, the heat energy is dissipated into the to the quenching media. The heat energy is dissipated to the quenching media at the specimen surface, and the rate of cooling for a particular quenching treatment depends on the ratio of surface of or to the mass of the specimen. Okay. Depends on ratio of the surface to the mass of the specimen. So I think it's true in this case. It's true. And moreover, if you go with that, then water, oil, and air, they are the most common quenching media used. So obviously, okay, so it, it, it's true. The answer is true in this case. The heat energy dissipated to the quenching media at the specimen surface and the rate of cooling for a particular quenching medium it depends on the ratio of surface to the mass of the specimen. So it is it is true in this case. Okay, the answer is true. The rate of cooling for a particular quenching media, quenching treatment depends on the ratio of the surface to the mass of the specimen. Ah, now the tempering and aging are the kinds of heat treatment which are applied to the hardened alloys. They involve certain phase transformations which makes the metal structure approach the equilibrium. What do you think? Is true or false? I think it's true in this case. I think it's true. The answer is true in this case. Now, carburizing is usually employed for treating certain types of machine elements. I repeat, carburizing is usually employed for treating certain types of machine elements which have which have used to which have to have a wear resistance working surface and tough core. Which have to have a wear resistance working surface and tough core. Gear wheels, shafts, pins, cam shafts, cam, etc. So I think it's true or false. So the answer is true in this case. Okay, the answer is true. A. Okay, so we have discussed about uh, all the MCQs. We have completed these ten MCQs, and these are the references which we should refer and discuss. Because see, uh, reading the references will obviously increase your knowledge. Okay, and you can also uh, understand this practice that through reading you. Uh, yeah, you can say you absorb the knowledge and while reading more and more diagrams you interface those diagrams give you uh, you can say an idea of understanding the process in a better way so try to refer these references which will help you thank you